Hi, everyone. So this is the first uh, Patreon only content. So quite exciting. Um, I did a poll a while ago. Sorry, this video is a bit late. Um, and what people wanted were early vampires. Now, I've talked about early vampires quite a bit. So I was thinking, what can I do that's a little bit different? And what I thought I'd do um, today is look in a little bit more detail at the pre-Polidorian vampire. So we're sort of used to the idea of the Polidori vampire, that first short story in English, at least, from 1819, really being a sort of starting point for our current and modern conception of the vampire, because Polidori obviously mixed the idea of the Byronic anti-hero, and in this case, the Byronic villain with the vampire to create this kind of aristocratic model that was so popular and so influential. But what did the vampire look like before um, Polidori? Was the vampire, as quite a lot of sort of general popular thought about vampires suggests, was it completely removed from this idea of aristocracy and from sexuality and from suavity? Were these vampires wandering around, just bits falling off, bloated corpses? What was the deal with vampires before the Polidorian aristocratic vamp? Well, as I'm presuming you're guessing, the difference isn't quite as drastic as we would suggest, but there are a lot more links between folkloric understandings of the vampire and the depiction of the vampire in those earlier examples. I'm going to be looking at a few different examples from both Germany and England because these are the sort of literary traditions where we're really seeing the development of this modern idea of the vampire. Now, in England, the vampire craze, as it were, comes to us in the mid 18th century with the publication um, of the Arnold Paul case in the London Magazine in 1732, which was um, a sort of story uh, that was reported as truth. It was a true life case of a man who, while serving on the border, is bitten by a vampire. He uh, eats dirt from the grave of that man's grave in order to sort of combat the vampirism, lives out the rest of his life, returns home, but when he dies, then he returns, spreading with him a sort of plague of sickness, feasting on his family and on his friends. Um, now, this was a, a real life case that was widely investigated. And it was so sort of uh, famous that it came to Britain and it came to be understood in Britain. Now, by the time it arrived in Britain, it had largely been rejected. And we don't really see an English or a British engagement with the idea of the vampire as real. Um, we see it more as a fictional figure. It is tied though to those folkloric roots and it's often tied to the folkloric and often theological beliefs which attach to the vampire in traditions where the vampire already existed. So I've talked about this before, but one of the ideas of the vampire that came out of Greece and particularly the Greek Orthodox Church was the idea of the vampire as an excommunicated soul that could not rest, a body that was then inhabited by a demon um, because had been sinful in life, essentially, because they had been excommunicated, thrown out of the protection of the church. So that's one sort of theological idea which is going to be feeding in. Then we also have, of course, that kind of Arnold Paul model. It's linked to a religious other because the biter was a Turk. Um, but it's also connected particularly to those ideas of um, a return, a corrupt return, which is infectious and preys on those that you love. So those are the sort of roots of the tradition. Now, how did it appear in literature? Well, we can go right back to the 1740s to find our first really literary vampire. And it's in 1748, we have Henrik August Ossenfelder's De Vampir which as you can tell from my terrible pronunciation, is a German poem. And it's interesting to note that right from this early stage, the vampire is being used as a symbol which is connected to sexuality and specifically transgressive sexuality. So let me read you a quick translation. Um, my dear young maiden clingeth, unbending fast and firm to all the long held teaching of a mother ever true. As in vampires and mortal, folks on the Thaces portal, Hayduck like to believe, but my Christine, thou dost dally 
and wilt my loving parry till I myself avenging to a vampire's health a drinking him toast and pale tokay. And as softly thou art sleeping, to thee shall I come creeping and thy life's blood drain away. And so shalt thou be trembling, for thus shall I be kissing and death's threshold, though it be crossing with fear in my cold arms. And last shall I be questioned, compared to such instruction, what are a mother's charms? So here we very clearly have the idea of the predatory vampire predatory in a sexual sense as well, um, where it's these unbidden lusts become sort of uh, associated with each other, this lust for blood, this lust for life, and this lust for the young woman in the poem. Now, we have to wait a little while for our next sort of literary vampires to really appear. And again, we're going to be staying in Germany with writers like Gottfried August Berger and Goethe writing poems where there are vampiric type figures. Now, Berger's Lenore features um, a girl whose beloved bridegroom has died and who she follows, believing him still alive and rides off to an early grave, essentially. Goethe's Bride of Corinth is a really interesting vampire or vampiric uh, poem partly interesting to me because of the religious elements of the tale. What we're quite used to, and what we will grow quite used to, is this idea of the vampire as a religious other, and particularly as a corrupted, perverse religious other. Now that is slightly flipped in the Goethe, slightly. What we have is the story of two young lovers, both pagans or non-Christians, who are attached um, to each other, but then, the bride's parents convert to Christianity and no longer wish for the marriage. And when he turns up at their house, the daughter is nowhere in sight, but she does come to him at night. And let me read to you what happens next. So, um, one second, I had it prepped, here we go. Quick the latch she raises, this is the mother, and with features anger flushed into the chamber highs. Are there in my house such shameless creatures minion to the stranger's will? She cries by the dying light. Who is to meets her sight? God, tis her own daughter she espies. And the youth in terror sought to cover with her own light veil the maiden's head, clasped her close, but gliding from her lover, back the vestment from her brow she spread, and her form upright and with ghostly might, long and slowly rises from the bed. Mother, Mother, wherefore thus deprive me of such joy as I this night have known? Wherefore from these warm embraces drive me? Was I wakened up to meet thy frown? Did it not suffice, suffice that in virgin, gui virgin guise to an early grave you brought me down? Fearful is the weird that forced me hither from the dark heaped chamber where I lay. Powerless are your drowsy anthems. Neither can your priests prevail how they pray. Salt nor lymph can cool where the pulse is full. Love must still burn on, though wrapped in clay. To this youth my early troth was plighted, while yet Venus ruled within the land. Mother, and that vow ye falsely slighted at your new and gloomy faith's command. But no god will hear if a mother swear, pure from love, to keep her daughter's hand. Nightly from my narrow chamber driven, come I to fulfil my destined part, him to seek to whom my troth was given and to draw the lifeblood from his heart. He hath served my will, more I yet must kill. For another prey, I now depart. So here we do have this religious other, again, the pagan who has not converted to Christianity, becoming a vampire and preying on the one that she loves. But she's not the one who really comes out as the villain in this piece. It is instead her mother's gloomy faith, which has broken vows and separated lovers, which comes out as the true villain of this vampiric tale. Now, let's move on from these German examples. Um, and I'm going to really stick with poetry. There is another German story um, from 1800, but you'll have to look at my other vampire videos to learn about that one. 
Instead, what I'm going to do is stick to the poetry and move on to British poetry now. And we're going to see from about the 1790s an interest in the vampire. Now, when I say the 1790s, I don't mean that there was necessarily anything published because the poem that I'm thinking about is Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Christabel. Again, we have a female vampire here. Now, he started writing it in the 1790s, but it wasn't published until 1816, and it's only a fragment. The vampiric nature of the protagonist is only suggested, and it's not actually Christabel that is the vampire, it's Geraldine, the strange woman that she finds in the woods. Now here, this air of sort of sexual transgression that is being associated with the vampire becomes explicitly linked with a sort of queer identity, with Geraldine slipping into bed, clasping to her bosom, uh, the innocent or seemingly innocent Christabel. Um, and this sort of association between um, the vampire and a queer sexuality is something that we also find, of course, in John Stagg's poem, The Vampire, where here we have a more sort of bisexual vampire um, going on. Let me just find the poem for us. I'm sorry, I didn't have this one ready, tut upon me. Um, let me read to you the whole poem and you can get the way in which um, these traditional understandings of the vampire are being used, are being engaged with this kind of folkloric conception, but also how it's being mixed in with ideas of sexual transgression and particularly a sort of queered sexual transgression. So the poem begins, why looks my lord so deadly pale? Why fades the crimson from his cheek? What can my dearest husband ail? The heartfelt cares, oh Herman, speak. Why at the silent hour of rest dost thou in sleep so sadly mourn? Has thou with heaviest grief oppressed, griefs too distressful to be borne? Why heaves thy breast? Why throbs thy heart? Oh speak, and if there be relief, thy Gertrude solace shall impart. If not, at least she'll share thy grief. One is that cheek which once the bloom of manly beauty sparkling showed. Dim are those eyes in pensive gloom that late with keenest luster glowed. Say why, too, at the midnight hour you sadly pant and tug for breath, as if some supernatural power were pulling you away to death. Restless, though sleeping, still you groan and with convulsive horror start. O Herman, to thy wife make known that grief which preys upon thy heart. O Gertrude. How shall I relate the uncommon anguish that I feel? Strange as severe is this my fate, a fate I cannot long conceal. In spite of all my wonted strength, stern destiny has sealed my doom. The dreadful malady at length will drag me to the silent tomb. But say, my Herman, what's the cause of this distress and all thy care? That vulture-like thy vitals gnaws and galls thy bosom with despair? Sure this can be no common grief, Sure, this can be no common pain. Speak, if this world contain relief, that soon thy Gertrude shall obtain. Oh, Gertrude, tis a horrid cause. Oh, Gertrude, tis unusual care, that vulture-like my vitals gnaws and galls my bosom with despair. Young Sigismund, my once dear friend, but lately he resigned his breath. With others I did him attend unto the silent house of death. For him I wept, for him I mourned paid all to friendship that was due. But sadly, friendship is returned. Thy Herman, he must follow too. He must follow to the gloomy grave in spite of human art or skill. No power on earth my life can save, tis fate's unalterable will. Young Sigismund, my once dear friend, but now my persecutor foul, doth his malevolence extend into the torture of my soul. By night, when wrapped in sound asleep, all mortals share a soft repose, my soul doth dreadful vigils keep, more keen than which hell scarcely knows. From the drear mansion of the tomb, from the low regions of the dead, the ghost of Sigismund doth roam and dreadful haunts me in my bed. There, vested in infernal guise, by means to me not understood, close to my side the goblin lies, and drinks away my vital blood, sucks from my veins the streaming life, and drains the fountains of my heart. Oh, Gertrude. Gertrude, dearest wife, unutterable is my smart. 
when surfeited, the goblin dire with banqueting by suckled gore will to his sepulchre retire till night invites him forth once more. Then will he dreadfully return, and from my veins life's juices drain, while slumbering I with anguish mourn and toss with agonising pain. Already I'm exhausted, spent. My, his carnival is nearly o'er, my soul with agony is rent. Tomorrow I shall be no more. But oh, my Gertrude, dearest wife, the keenest pangs of last remained. When dead, I too shall seek thy life, thy blood by Hermann shall be drained. But to avoid this horrid fate, soon as I'm dead and laid in earth, drive through my corpse a javelin straight. This shall prevent my coming forth. A watch with me, this last sad night, watch in your chamber here alone, but carefully conceal the light until you hear my parting moan. Groan. Then at what time the vesper bell of yonder convent shall be told, that peal shall ring my passing knell, and Herman's body shall be cold. Then and just then thy lamp make bare, the starting ray, the bursting light, shall from my side the goblin scare and show him visible to sight. A live long night, poor Gertrude sate, watched by her sleeping, dying lord. The live long night she mourned his fate, the object whom her soul adored. Then at what time the vesper bell of yonder convent sadly told, for then was peeled his passing knell, the hapless Herman, he was cold. Just at that moment, Gertrude drew from neath her cloak the hidden light, when dreadful she beheld in view the shade of Sigismund, sad sight. Indignant rolled his ireful eyes that gleamed with wild horrific stare, and fixed a moment with surprise beheld aghast the enlightening glare. His jaws cadaverous were besmeared with clotted carnage o'er and o'er, and all his horrid hole appeared distent and filled with human gore. With hideous scowl the spectre fled, she shrieked aloud, she swooned away. The hapless Herman in his bed, all pale, a lifeless body lay. Next day in council t'was decreed, urged at the instance of the state, that shuddering nature should be freed from pests like these. T'was too late. The church that burst the funeral dome where Sigismund was lately laid, the, ch the choir then burst the funeral dome where Sigismund was lately laid, and found him, though within the tomb, still warm as life and undecayed. With blood his visage was disdained, ensanguined were his frightful eyes, each sign of former life remained, save that all motionless he lies. The corpse of Herman they contrive to the same sepulchre to take, and through both carcasses they drive deep in the earth a sharpened stake. By this was finished their career. Through this no longer they can roam. From them their friends have naught to fear. Both quiet, keep the slumbering tomb. So we have the Germanic influence in the names. We also have a tale. It's got some really interesting components to it. I think there's an interesting parity between the relationship he has with Sigmund and the relationship he has with his wife. Um, this kind of idea that in both cases, vampirism um, is inevitable. Um, there's also something interesting to me just logically in this tale. He's like, there's nothing that can be done, nothing at all. <laughs> um, but he doesn't actually try to do anything either. And, you know, he has this thing where he's like, look, behold, when I'm already dead and you'll see the spectre. But, you know, not before then. Don't let him not kill me. Um, which is an interesting sort of, uh, sort of slant on what's going on, an interesting part of what's going on. And of course, we then have the dual death at the end, laid side by side forever, Herman and Sigismund. So as you can see, there are these sort of transgressive, queer desires being hinted at and encoded within the vampire here. Now, the last two examples that I'm looking at are interesting for being sort of uh, by romantic writers or proto-romantic writers in perhaps the case of Robert Southey, um, when he was writing. Now, let's just say romantic writers. Um, they are writing within sort of the area of romanticism and there is a sort of step back in a sense, um, a step back into a greater kind of engagement with the folkloric. Now the romantic period of course was full of this attempt to engage with uh, folkloric origins, uh, oral uh, storytelling, oral folklore, or uh, ballads and this kind of engagement with folk production. And what we see in both Robert Southey and uh, Lord Byron's work 
is this return to the folkloric conception of the vampire being foregrounded, moving away from many of those sexual connotations and putting it back in, um, in the sort of context that relies directly on the Arnold Paul case and uh, sort of these Greek theological ideas. In fact, in both cases, both authors include extra material along with the poem, which explains the folklore and the myth around the vampire using contemporary sources, multiple contemporary sources in the case of Southey, and giving an idea of some of the beliefs that are connected to the vampire. Now, in both cases, Southey and Byron include a vampiric passage as part of a much longer poem. In one of these poems, there is no vampire, there is simply a vampiric curse, and that is found in Byron's The Geo, which um, dates back to 1813. So we're already sort of coming up, we're on the cusp now, um, of uh, the Polidorian vampire. But in the Geo, we have uh, the tale of a man whose uh, lover was killed by her husband. Um, and we have him coming for vengeance and then riding off into the distance. And while he is uh, sort of riding, um, he, a curse is put upon him by a humble fisherman. And the curse specifically is vampirism. And you can see from the description of vampirism, a particular idea of the vampire, which is being evoked. Again, that folkloric vampire. So the curse is, but thou false infidel shall writhe beneath avenging monkey's scythe and from its torments scape alone to wander round lost Eblis throne and fire unquenched, unquenchable around within thy heart shall dwell. Nor ear can hear, nor tongue can tell the tortures of that inward hell. But first, on earth as vampire scent, thy course shall from its tomb be rent, then ghastly haunt thy native place and suck the blood of all thy race. There from thy daughter, sister, wife, at midnight drain the stream of life, yet loathe the banquet which perforce must feed thy livid living course. Thy victims, ere they yet expire, shall know the demon for their sire, as cursing thee, thou cursing them, thy flowers are withered on the stem. But one that for thy crime must fall, the youngest, most beloved of all, shall bless thee with a father's name. That word shall wrap thy heart in flame. Yet must thou end thy task and mark her cheek's last tinge, her eye's last spark, and the last glassy glance must view which freezes o'er its lifeless blue. blue. Then with unhallowed hand shall tear the tresses of her yellow hair, of which in life a lock when shorn, affection's fondest pledge was worn, but now is borne away by thee, memorial of thine agony. Wet with thine own best blood shall drip thy gnashing tooth and haggard lip. Then, stalking to thy sullen grave, go and with ghouls and afrits rave, till those in horror shrink away from spectre more accursed than they. So the idea of the vampiric nature here very much being seen as a curse, cast in sort of theological terms, although of course the setting of the deal and the curse itself is delivered uh, by a Muslim character. Um, in both Southey and Byron, what we're finding is the introduction of the vampire within an Islamic context, which is an interesting uh, sort of conflation um, of different sources, um, different ideas within one poem. Um, but what we have is this idea of the vampire being forced and sent back, forced to return, sent back to commit crimes against himself, in a sense, against his own family, unable to control the return. This is a enforced punishment and the vampire is destined to suck the blood of all of his race, to kill those most dear to him. And we have this idea of the vampire is particularly targeting loved ones, of course, in the folkloric element, but also in Robert Southey. Now, Robert Southey's epic poem, To Love of the Destroyer, is very, very long. It's about um, a Muslim hero, although written in very sort of Protestantized terms, realistically, on a quest against uh, sort of demons. And while he's on his quest, he falls in love with a lady called Anaza. But she dies, sadly, um, and she keeps returning in the graveyard where she's buried. And so at one point, he and her father go to the graveyard to try and exercise this spirit of sorts. So 
Let me read this graveyard scene to you. A night of darkness and of storms into the chamber of the tomb to Labba led the old man to roof him from the rain. A night of storms, the wind swept through the moonless sky and moaned among the pillared sepulchres. And in the pauses of its sweep, they heard the heavy rain beat on the monument above. In silence on Anaza's grave, the father and the husband sate. The choir from the minaret proclaimed the midnight hour. Now, now, cried Talaba, and o'er the chamber of the tomb there spread a lurid gleam, like the reflection of a sulphur fire. And in that hideous light, Anaza stood before them. It was she, her very lineaments, and such as death had changed them, livid cheeks and the lips of blue, but in her eyes, there dwelt brightness more terrible than all the loathsomeness of death. Still art thou living, wretch? In hollow tones she cried to Delaba. And must I nightly leave my grave to tell thee, still in vain, God has abandoned thee? This is not she, the old man exclaimed. A fiend, a manifest fiend. And to the youth he held his lance. Strike and deliver thyself. Strike her, cried Talaba, and palsied of all powers gazed fixedly upon the dreadful form. Yea, strike her, cried a voice whose tones flowed with such sudden healing through his soul. And when the desert shower from death delivered him, but unobedient to that well-known voice, his eye was seeking it. When Moeth, firm of heart, performed the bidding, though the vampire corpse, he thrust his lance. It fell, and howling with the wind, its demon tenant fled. A sapphire light fell on them, and garmented with glory in their sight, a Naza's spirit stood. O Talaba, she cried, abandon not thyself. Wouldst thou forever lose me? Go, fulfill thy quest in the bowels of paradise. In vain, I might not wait for thee, O my husband. So what happens in this passage, of course, is that um, the vampire appears, a naser appears, but it's not a naser, it's her body being inhabited by a demon. Now, this is an idea of the vampiric that dates back to that sort of Greek Orthodox tradition. Um, so obviously it's being taken out of that Greek Orthodox context and put inside a very different context here. Um, at this point, the old man, the father, tells him to strike down um, the vampire, but Talaba cannot. Then another voice, a known voice, her voice, interestingly, comes and tells him to strike down the vampiric figure. So we have this idea of a sort of separate Onesa still acting and having a will of her own outside of the sort of demon inhabited vampire corpse. Um, Talaba still cannot harm her. And so it, it falls to her father to pierce her body with a lance. Um, at which point she celebrates her freedom and obviously calls on Talaba to stop faffing about, basically, and get on with his quest because what's happened is he's been stalled not just by, by her death, but by this demon, essentially, by her reappearance again and again and again. He's been locked in place. And it's both a literal demon, but also a dream of doubt and uncertainty, which has held him locked at a certain point in his quest. Therefore, the vampire becomes both a sort of folkloric element, it becomes a representation as well of particular, if we want to say, uh, sort of sins in a sense, it becomes a representative of these ideas of uh, doubt and theological hesitation. Um, and the vampire must be killed in order for Talaba to proceed on his quest. Now, as you can see, there's lots of different ways in which the vampire manifested pre-Polidori and lots of different uh, ideological roots being mixed together, lots of different types of depiction being mixed together. We already have this idea of the vampire as a borderline tragic figure. We have the idea of the vampire being mixed in particularly with sexual transgression. We have the vampire as this sort of liminal being. We have the vampire as this cursed self. So all of these, I'm sure you'll see, um, are ideas of the vampire that tie back into our modern representations. So even before Polidori, a lot of the elements of the modern vampire were already there. Now, please do feel free. I'd love to hear from people. What are your favorite vampire depictions, either past 
or present? And how do you see these ideas and tropes of the vampire reappearing in modern fiction? Thanks for listening. Hopefully that was fun. It's a little bit more conversational than usual. Um, if that's not what you want and you want a super produced, very well presented, no mistakes sort of a video, also feel free to give that feedback. Um, I can't promise anything because you know me. I'm full of mistakes, full of miss sayings, full of mispronunciations, but I'll do my best. Anyway, um, if you enjoy this chatty format as well, do tell me. Um, I am happy to sort of do the videos that people are wanting to see. Anyway, goodbye, ghouls, and thanks for your support on Patreon. <laughs>